I'm Frank Partnoy, and I'm the author of Wait, the Art and Science of Delay. Part of what's happening when we have uh, decisions that require only milliseconds is entirely preconscious. So this is us uh, where we really are acting like animals. We don't have the capacity for conscious contemplation, so we're uh, reacting instinctively. This is the, the firefighter arriving at the scene and not making a decision. When, when Gary Klein first did his uh, initial study for the military, and started doing field work asking firefighters about their decision making, they were puzzled because they said, well, we never, I don't know when I've ever made a decision. They simply didn't understand what the military and Gary Klein were talking about because what they were doing was all at the pre-conscious milliseconds long level. And this is where we really do harness our, our hardwiring, our, our, our biological fight or flight reactions. Um, many of the things that I that I found in in weight uh, suggest that there are nuances to those biological reactions that people haven't uh, understood quite as well. That not all of it is happening in the brain. That actually there's a fair amount happening in uh, the vagal nerve, vagal nerve complex in particular, the ten, the the tenth cranial nerve, the the nerve known as the vagal nerve that winds around from the base of the brain stem down through our bodies, around our heart and gut, that controls a lot of our uh, biological apparatus within milliseconds, that regulates our heart rate variability, the milliseconds long changes in our heart that scientists have shown um, are highly relevant to our emotional well-being. There's an interesting study that I, I, I found uh, that Stephen Porges and, and others had done of infants where uh, he had taken a group of nine-month-olds and had uh, tested them in various standard ways using the Bailey Infant Scales uh, development uh, test, which tests uh, responses to different kinds of stimulus, playing with toys and so forth. Had also uh, asked their parents um, questions about their behavior and how they reacted, and then had tested milliseconds-long physical responses in terms of heart rate variability. And those were the tests at nine months. Then he brought these same uh, kids back at uh, age three years and studied which of these tests uh, predicted their emotional states or their behaviors at age three years. And one of the amazing things that he found was that the um, Bailey Scales tests uh, weren't predictive, that what parents thought of their own kids how they answered these survey questions weren't predictive, but that what was predictive was heart rate variability, that having a highly variable heart rate, that sort of being able to quickly accelerate and quickly decelerate would predict whether a, a baby, and now a three-year-old, would have good emotional health. And the intuition behind that is that if you have the ability to accelerate and decelerate your heart rate quickly. Okay, so we're talking about, imagine two babies that each have 100 uh, uh, beats per minute on average, 100 beats per minute. Um, one is only able to vary in a narrow band, say between 90 and 100. The other is able to vary in a wider band, say between 80 and 120. The one that is able to vary in a wider band will be more resilient in a way in responding to stimulus. It, it will be able to accelerate and decelerate, sort of like a high-performance car. And the idea is that if you're driving a high-performance car on a winding road, it might be very dangerous, but you'll feel safer if you have the ability to accelerate and brake very quickly. And one of the amazing things that scientists have found is that this kind of hardwiring actually is related to um, all kinds of emotional problems that heart rate variability is, is uh, and this is controversial, but appears to be associated with asthma, autism, borderline personality disorder. So there's a way in which um, this kind of apparatus within our bodies is influencing our decisions in ways people previously hadn't understood. Um, more generally, the uh, ways that we respond pre-consciously are governed by biological reflexes. They're, they're less conscious contemplation and more uh, simply reaction.
So, of course, some people will take these findings and try to fight against their own hardwiring or find a pill or exercise that we can do that will resolve this in the same way uh, that when parents learned about Walter Michel's uh, research in his marshmallow experiments showing that four-year-old children who could delay uh, the receipt of a second marshmallow for 15 minutes performed better on standardized tests later, um, that those parents tried to get their children to wait 15 minutes for a second marshmallow, we'll all be tempted to say, oh, I, I need to figure out how to um, change my heart rate variability. And this is all very much cutting edge now. It might be the case that in the future we'll use heart rate variability as a measure of mental health in the same way we use uh, blood pressure or cholesterol as a measure of physical health. But it, but it is quite preliminary. W one of the things that it has uh, justified is a kind of uh, approach to physical health that a lot of people use anyway. Um, exercise, meditation, yoga, these have all been shown to be associated with um, this kind of heart rate variability response. Part of it is, again, um, hardwired. So we have here, as in many areas, a debate about nature versus nurture. Um, but part of it we, we clearly are able to affect. And even if we can't affect it, we can understand it at some level. So that um, uh, one of the things that Stephen Porges has shown is that safety is incredibly important to the development of infants and young children. That that uh, one of the things that can happen with the vagal nerve is that they, uh, young kids and infants, can respond very negatively to serious stressors, to a gunshot being fired or to being screamed at. Uh, and that what we regard as scary um, might not be what their body regards as scary. So that if we're trying to find rules, it, it might be that we're so far along as adults that it's too late, although there is some evidence that exercise and, and uh, meditation can improve our own heart rate variability. But, but as, as a policy measure, one of the most important things that we can do is try to understand this for the next generation for children. And although we might not think that a scary Halloween mask is really scary, if a young child or infant's body is responding to it with a shutdown reflex, then it is scary. If we're screaming um, get your hand away from that stove, that hot stove or that knife, um, because we think that it's going to protect our child, that we might actually be doing the child a great disservice because our intonation, our loud voice, our threat might trigger a kind of uh, vagal shutdown response, much like a, a reptilian uh, response that can have negative uh, repercussions later on. So it's something that... Um, that is, again, very much uh, a cutting edge uh, set of research, but hasn't yet found its way into a lot of policy literature, and yet it's very closely related to the literature that has about um, our, our brain reactions and neurological responses. And so I think it should be. I think it's something that we should put on the table for thinking about in our own decision making. It's a very interesting question. I, I doubt that bankers will try to use um, the my brain made me defraud you uh, argument, uh, particularly in the civil context. But, but there is a lot of research that suggests that not just our brains, but our vagal responses are crucial to our reactions and decisions. And to the extent people are using fMRI now, um, I can easily imagine an argument for using heart rate variability or even faster responses. Until recently, fMRI uh, uh, rea uh, readings were not fast enough to capture uh, milliseconds long responses. And those that are being used in trials now are often uh, using the older uh, technology and so really aren't capturing these super quick uh, uh, kinds of responses. And so as we as technology gets better and we're able to capture instead of just seconds, uh, milliseconds, it might be that we that we widen the scope of what is fair game uh, in thinking about intentionality and, and culpability. 
And it's very interesting to think about this in the context of the effects of subliminal messaging on us. Um, for example, I can make you read 20% faster by subliminally flashing a fast food logo at you. You won't realize that you've seen it, but Sanford DeVoe, a psychologist at the University of Toronto, has shown that when he flashes, again, subliminally, this is just milliseconds, people don't consciously understand that they've seen any of this, but he subliminally flashes McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's logos at people on a computer, that they then react, that they respond, they read 20% faster, they have a harder time enjoying beautiful photographs or images, they think that music is taking too long, uh, they become progressively more impatient. And this again goes back to the question of how the crush of technology is impacting all of us and speeding up our decisions and reactions. And I can easily imagine that, that in the future someone would argue that the subliminal messages or the crush of technology led them to react more quickly than uh, they otherwise would have. I'm not sure how much play that argument would have in the courts, but certainly in our own lives and our own decisions, it's hugely important to understand how various aspects of technology and just our world overall um, are impacting our responses. And, and they are. Um, we, we are. When we are exposed to, um, to images, as we are constantly, it affects our decision-making. One, one other example uh, is race. Um, clearly, uh, 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 race and, and images of, of uh, different um, faces uh, of different races impact our decisions and, and judgments. Um, however, if we can harness our capacity to be unanimal-like, to be, to be human-like, and think about the future and take a conscious pause, we can counteract some of that. And it'd be interesting um, in, in terms of, of future applications, whether this uh, capacity to counter our own snap biases will play a role. There, there was a study done by a group of researchers of doctors. Um, doctors generally are not racist. Uh, however, studies have shown that doctors tend to react differentially based on race. Um, and what these researchers wanted to do at first was replicate this study. And so they created a situation where a patient, uh, a photograph that was shown to half of the doctors, one, one half saw a white patient, one half saw a black patient. And as with other studies, the doctors systematically undertreated the black patient. This is an uncontroversial result in the literature that doctors, because of their implicit biases, as shown on implicit association tests, um, tend to undertreat black patients. However, one of the interesting aspects of this study was that there have been so many of these studies done that a subgroup of the doctors figured out that what the researchers were testing was their own racial biases. About a quarter of the doctors figured out that this was a test about race. And for those doctors, for the subgroup who understood that their own racial biases were being tested, they did not systematically undertreat the black patient. In other words, once race was an issue for these doctors, race was no longer an issue. And what it illustrates, I think, is that we have this capacity to consciously understand our own unconscious biases, and that often when we do understand them, we can reverse them.